All right, so um, I am so thrilled to have uh, Diane Menashe here on the Killer Cross-Examination podcast. So you, for those of you who don't know, and if you know anything about me, if you've read any of my tweets or Facebook posts or social media, or just have heard me yell from my office as I was watching the William Husel trial, you know that I thought like uh, a star was born in the middle of that uh, trial. And it was, uh, it was you, Diane. I thought you were brilliant and um, said so and wrote about it. And I talked about it. I, I tweeted about it. Linda and I were talking in our little earpieces on Law and Crime about what a great job you did. So I'm definitely part of the um, Diana Nashi fan club. Um, and so to have you here on this podcast talking to me is a real honor. So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I, you can't get better PR than you've given me. So thank you. So, well, you need a better <laughs> PR person. So, <laughs> all right. We've been talking about doing this podcast for, for a bit, I know. Um, tell me if you would, I want to just kind of cover a little bit of ground just so people can kind of catch up to where you and I are and how and what you've been doing lately. So first of all, you, you just, you, you obtained a verdict in what we all thought was the trial of the century in Ohio, which was the William Husel case. Um, and I want to talk to you about the William Husel case because people were just talking about that verdict and following that case. And then, of course, there was another trial of the century that you just tried. And then, of course, there, we're waiting on a verdict in the Depp Heard case, which is uh, the new trial of the century. So I'm giving is that one. what's that? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> tell me, tell me, first of all, tell me about the William Husel case. What can you tell me about how you got involved? What was it like to be in the middle of that? Um, I guess that the eye of the hurricane, what was that like? Well, I got involved because the client actually hired um, Jose and I caught wind of it from a federal judge here who's actually our chief judge. And Jose didn't tell me, although we know each other from teaching at Harvard, but I heard that he was interviewing people for local counsel. Um, and so me being me, I pick up the phone. I literally still remember where I was standing in my driveway and I was like, hey, Jose, <laughs> it's Diane. <laughs> like, you don't need to interview people here because I'm here and we, we still laugh about it today. But, um, but I said, you know, like I want in on this. And, um, and we laughed and, um, and he said, well, you know, I want to interview a couple people. The clients kind of wants to, you know, do a, do a thorough kind of search for co-counsel, local counsel. And Jose was very clear in the beginning. He really just needed and wanted a local counsel. I don't want to say a potted plant, but Neil, you know, like sometimes lawyers just want like a name to pro hawk in, right? Um, and so Jose and I had to work through that. There was a little bit in the beginning of, you know, I, I'm not a potted plant. And I, I wanted to make sure that Jose really did know that um, I wasn't just going to be a name only because I, I have tried so many cases here. So we got through all that kind of um, initial dating, if you will. And then I got on board and um, and it was a really it was a really crazy ride. I, it was a ride. I was going to ask you, I was going to use that phrase because it seemed like a wild a wild ride i mean it ended well your seatbelts were on you guys weren't thrown from the the ride but it seemed like a wild ride and it was like so many starts and stops like you know we'd go to boston and interview an expert a potential expert at harvard and would leave the building and be like yes he's amazing and then three hours later we'd get a phone call from the experts saying, I want to help, but Harvard won't let me. I mean, it was just this roller coaster. And this happened, Neil, with experts. Well, it happened two weeks before the trial. I mean, we it was one of the one of the other experts that we lost. So, you know, it was it was these like starts and stops so much. And then there was this, you know, there was the litigation it was also so, you know, there was the motion to dismiss, and then all of the pretrial litigation was really like um you know heavily litigated and then you stop and you wait and then was the state going to dismiss the charges we stop we wait and then they dismissed you know 11 of, of 25 and left 14 and it was just constantly there was no flow to it you know sometimes we have these litigation cases which just kind of you know um there there's there's the top of the mountain this was just so undulating the whole time so how 
So, so just give us a little bit of a backdrop, like the elevator pitch about the case. So there's a doctor, William Husel, um, who worked at a, um, at a relatively prominent hospital, a very well-known hospital, right? Yes. Um, and he was uh, in, he worked in the ER. In, in, the I in, in intensive care, right? Yeah, intensive okay. care. And um, it seemed like from what I could tell about the, the watching the trial, because I certainly watched enough of it, um, it seemed like he was really well respected by his peers. And I, I want to talk to you about a little bit about that, because I thought that really ended up you were able to use the state's witnesses as witnesses for your client. Um, and and then it, it, it seemed like there was somehow a controversy that developed and then admin and bureaucracy and maybe some bean counters came in and decided someone had to be, I think that they used a particular phrase in a memo, which was the, a villain. The villain. A villain. <clears throat> so how, if you can give me sort of the elevator pitch, so we're all on the same page, how did that all come together and how did they decide that William Husel ended up being the villain and nobody else got charged. You know, that was so much of our narrative. We were able to get the, the hospital hired a PR firm when this first um, began to be investigated. And it was the PR docs that we were able to get to the discovery process that said, you refer to him as a villain when you're talking to the media or referring to him in any kind of um, written statement. So that we, we wove that in. Certainly Jose really liked that, that kind of uh, villain theory and, and why they pinpointed William. I will say though, Neil, that this all began with a diversion complaint was that one of the nurses was was suspected of stealing meds and when they peeled back the layers of that onion then it was like oh well here's this doctor doing this at the night but it all began off a suspicious of uh, nurses were diverting meds which had been a problem at Mount Carmel I, as to his character though it was brilliant because as you know we, we're so hesitant as defense attorneys, right, about, well, it's ultimately our client's decision to testify or not, you know, putting their character up and their testimony up, of course, comes with myriad um, issues, right? Even, even in the most true telling of clients that it creates. Right. And because he was so well respected, went to Cleveland Clinic, Neil, he got doctor of the year twice while at, while at this hospital. It's crazy. It's amazing. Nurse, chart nurses, pharmacists, everyone loved him. Right. Doctor of the Year to no. villain, right? It's villain. I know. To, mur to mass murder. It's crazy. It was crazy, but we were able to use their witnesses as character witnesses without having to expose him as we would have had he testified. It was really, I think, one of the better ways that the evidence unfolded. And, and I think we used... You know, it's what I always say, and I kind of loved it that you appreciated this about me. I love to use the state's exhibits as my own. I thought it was great. Yeah. <laughs> I love to use the state's experts as our own, right? And, and you and I were just talking about this. And their witnesses became our own. They became our own character witnesses without us even having to call a soul and being able to lead them, which is, of course, a win all day long. So um, that was really that was really part of it. Because that's like an Aikido sort of martial art type, you know, move where your where your opponent is just charging at you and you have the ability to sort of, you know, step away and just put your hand on on his or her back and make sure that they really hit the ground. You don't need to tackle the guy if he's tackling himself. And in a way when you can actually stand there as you did and cross-examine the the witnesses and turn them into either character witnesses that your that Dr. Husel was a, or any client for that matter was careful, conscientious, and sometimes you don't even see that stuff when you start to review the case. But it sort of you're able to pull it out of the witnesses once you sort of you know what I mean. Like I was really surprised that they were saying that about Dr. Husel. That may be the one line you see, and then as you peel back, you start thinking, okay, well you you said that. And there's a reason why you said that, and the reason you said that is because. You always knew the guy was super conscientious and careful and right. And those things can blow up in a case. And, and yes. And then Neil, think of this too, because I talked to the jurors and they said, this hit them was we had the character witnesses on one side. And then I handled the family members, which 
we can talk about it, but those were some of the, actually the toughest crosses I've done um, because it was like family member after family member, but you had the compassionate nurses and pharmacists that he's such a good guy. And then you had these family members that were reiterating that villain, right, narrative. And then we were able to get out that they all had pending civil suits. So again, it was like a, a, a mirror of what the hospital was doing, is that they were scapegoating someone, right? So that the hospital could escape culpability. And right. these members, sadly, were, were scapegoating so that they could get these monetary settlements. And the jury, well, that uh, argument wasn't yeah, perfect. I would love to hear. I want to hear about that. Tell me that oh, part of it. It was amazing. When I went back there, one of the jurors, and I've, I've come to know the jurors, it's an incredible group of people, um, said to me, you know, when we went round Rob and I spent a couple hours with them, and he said, you know, we all really appreciated how you handled the family members. And I was like, oh, you know, I thank you for saying that because I was, it was, it was difficult. And he said, you know, when you needed to be harsh, you were harsh, but when you needed to be soft, you were soft. And I said, thanks. And he said, I speak for us all when we completely nullified all the family testimony. Because like the hospital, they were biased. He said that. Wow. So they got it. Like they, they, and, and that's kind of, that's the beauty, right? When you were talking about how we can just chip away and, and we don't even have to explicitly be making the argument, but the jurors are so smart and they literally wove that together themselves and came to the result that I was truly hoping they would. So it, it was let me, let me, so this case touched on so many issues. Um, I know that you've tried some high profile cases because I, you know, I was able to look some of them up. I saw one, you did a, a case where I believe you made a very compelling argument during a closing argument in a death penalty case. And I think saved, uh, uh, looked like uh, someone from uh, a death penalty. And I saw the argument there. Um, but besides that, what is your, what's your background in like this sort of healthcare type case, this sort of medical case. And here's the reason why I ask. It's not a typical, I don't want to say typical. It's not your like main street kind of down the lane criminal case where we're, because you have to not only know the law and deal with credibility issues, but you also had to deal with um, complex medical evidence. I mean, really complex stuff. And, so and what's your secret? Well, Neil, your secret? I, is it like for Tell us, us your secret. We think <laughs> criminal cases and we think of like reasonable doubt. It sounds cliche, but this is how we win cases, right? We pick apart the police work. We there's snitches, right? We pick apart, you know, their shoddy investigation or what they didn't do. And and that's that's so much success of our criminal work. And to to your point, Husel was Husel was so much more than that. And to really get around the science was a tremendous um, lift. <laughs> I will say though, what it did for me now moving forward in my career, I mean, first proved a lot of people wrong, but you know, I just tried a two week civil case that was a negligence fraud fiduciary duty case. I, like it proves that if you're a trial lawyer, if you're a real trial lawyer, and I don't mean a litigator, <laughs> I, I understand. Mean, I know the I difference. Yeah. Yeah. There's no civil, criminal, healthcare, OVI, death penalty. You can do it. If you understand how to pick a jury, if you understand how to pick a theme, if you understand what works where you are, if you truly understand how to try a case, you can do that in any context. It is an incredible amount of work. There's no question about that. And learning the science for me was really important because I think one of the, the reasons why I win and why I'm successful is jurors find me to be authentic, not soft or approachable, but th they'll always say to me at the end, like, you were no bullshit, right? You said it like it was, you picked your battles, we trusted what you said. And you can't trust a defense attorney unless they actually know the evidence. You just can't. I agree. So. Let me ask you this. So tell me your background. How did you get into trying cases? Because you're very passionate about it, obviously. You believe in it. You're, you teach at Harvard, which says something about, you know, something about you and or something about Harvard. But um, 
but but tell me like how did you get to this point in your career did you always want to be a trial lawyer kind of fill us in on those yeah you know, the, the the background i always wanted to be a trial lawyer um i loved you know i came from a family of wealth and i loved um and i really mean this i I always wanted to kind of help those that are less fortunate. And I got that from my father, who was very philanthropic. And while he was a businessman, you know, we didn't spend holidays, you know, um, lavishing gifts, you know, amongst our family. We were very much about giving back to the community. And, um, and I really grew up with that. And, and doing trials and really criminal justice and sort of helping the underdog, if you would, was really part of my narrative and, and what became important to me. I went to law school. I started, I was in the clinic there. I started focusing on capital work. You know, the death penalty is, is something that I'm passionate about. Um, I don't mean passionate about like I'm out there carrying pickets because that's, I'm not that way in any way. I'm just, I, I don't think we should have the death penalty. Um, and I've committed to doing those types of cases until we don't have them, which, which has been a long, a long life's work because they've done over 40 state and federal capital cases at this point. So, um, but you know, I think Kelly's wrong. Um, and, and it's, it's when the government sanctions it, it's, it's, uh, in that way, it's equally wrong. So that's sort of my journey. I, I was fortunate that Neil, I started the state public defender's office and I was trying my first capital case within a year of being licensed. And I just have had an incredible opportunity to do really big cases where honestly, the numbers were too big for clients to take deals. And you know, this, that means trials. And right. I, I right. tried 150 cases, uh, jury trials in my life. And, and people ask me like, how do I get that many trials? And Neil, I, I don't know if it's possible anymore. Like, I, I don't know if, I, I don't know. I mean, you can't get that many trials from civil work, obviously. And I think in the criminal space, they have to be pretty high level to where right. clients just can't fathom taking 30, 40 it's, life. It's, it's, a, it's a different environment. So I, yeah. it's a great point you touched on. Um, and in my own way, so as I hear you telling it, was sort of my third ear, you know what I mean? I kind of, I hear a, a similar story in a way. I wanted to be a trial lawyer, and I kept doing the march of the blue suits, the blue suit, regiment tie, white Oxford shirt, and with the, the, the leather folder that, you know, an aunt or a, a great aunt or your mother's best friend gave you that has like your monogram on the bottom that everybody carries to every interview until you realize that that when you walk in with those, the interview is over because I mean, nobody uses that, that, that sort of leather thing. Right. So I remember when I had that leather thing and I used to go around to these law firms and I would interview with them when I was in law school and associates were interviewing me and partners. And I'm sure they all thought like, what an ass. Mm -hmm. You know, I had not an interview. Well, well, <laughs> I didn't know anything about interviewing. You know what I mean? I didn't. Uh, I was like, so I kept on whatever method I was using. The person probably right behind me got the, got the offer. So I would go in and do the, you know, I would try the reverse gorilla interview marketing technique, you know? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to interview you. And they'd be like, see ya, you know? <laughs> So finally, I, I, I talked to my father's, a uh, friend of my father's, and he said, you want to be a trial lawyer? And I said, yeah. He goes, okay, well, come talk to me. I think I'm going to go like talk about a job. And he says, okay, look, exactly what you just said. You want to be a trial lawyer? That's great. First of all, you don't know what that means. Second of all, nobody is going to let you try cases for them, large firm or client, unless you have experience. Yeah. And your experience has to be experienced enough that you've seen enough that you get to go out and do it. That's going to be in a prosecutor's office or in a defender's office. So he goes, that's it. That's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a trial lawyer, go get, you know, go get experience somewhere. So I did. And that and is hot. And <clears throat> I don't know that, I don't know that that's really possible as much these days. Cause there are a lot of lawyers out there who they want to be trial lawyers, but they don't necessarily know how to get in there and do it. You know what I mean? And they can't get the experience doing it. And COVID and Zoom, as much as I love the virtual technology for some things, it, it did not help advance. It helped make law, lawyers' lives easier, in my opinion, in many ways, but it didn't help 
develop young trial lawyers because there were no trials for two years. For sure. But also being a good trial lawyer is knowing how to connect with people. And you're not doing that on a virtual platform. You're not. You're not actually like working the room. You're not reading people's body, body language. I will tell you, truly, in this civil case I just tried, you know, I'm like day three in, in a very, a, a community of 28,000 people, 18% unemployment. And Neil, I want you to judge me. Did they know you? Did they know you? No, no, but I want you to judge me for what I'm about to say. Okay, I wondered if they were like- oh, I'm a girl that like drives to Hi, the- Hi, my name's Diane Manashi, and I'm, <laughs> I speak for, and I, that was your I, line too. Hi, I, I, to the witness. Every time I stand up, Diane Manashi on behalf of- Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm the girl that like drives 20 minutes to get a Starbucks in the, you know, the town that has one. And I come back and I put like my $15 worth of coffee drinks on the table, you know? And I say this because here I am like the end of day two and, and I'm like, shame on me. I mean, shame on me for, you know, this is the thing when you do kind of steamroll into a different jurisdiction, there's a part of us that are really real deal trial lawyers that are just kind of like, I'm here, this is me, you know? But the optics are so important and we lose the understanding and the appreciation of that when all we do is communicate virtually. Because honestly, I noticed one juror was really, one woman was really looking me up and down. And I don't mean this in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to my associate, she does not like me. <laughs> Mrs. Miles was her name. And I was like, give a week. Gives me a week there. Took the coffee drinks off the table, you know, like made eye contact with her, but not so much. Let her be a voyeur without, you know, any judgment and all the things. She ended up being a huge advocate in the jury room. And afterwards she said to me, I didn't like you at first, but I came around. And, and I did, we lose so much, right? When, we, when we're not in a room and we understand how we're being perceived because I think as trial lawyers, we should never be consumed with what people think of us because we'll never be successful if we are. But I think we are being foolish if we're not at least cognizant of it. We need to be, we need to understand what people are thinking about us and then navigate accordingly. I don't think we need to be consumed by it because we'd never be able to do what we do, but it's important. But are those are, those are great points and I don't wanna, I don't wanna lose those points. So, so when you're saying, so, and, and this is going to happen more and more, I think, as you continue on with your career, particularly after that, the useful case. And, you know, not that th those cases stand out, but, you know, those were to have a case that's nationally televised, oh, that's sure. followed and to be successful during it and to do it um, at the side by side and to remain in lockstep, so to speak, with a um, you know, a, a, a nationally known lawyer um, really is something that, you know, I mean, those are, that's like hitting, that's like bottom of the ninth kind of, right? <laughs> hey, Manashi, get off the bench. You know what I mean? I, 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 what are you right. talking about? Right. Get up here I, and, and you got to face Catfish Hunter and, you know, you got to knock it out of the park. You got to <laughs> win. Want me out of the dugout? Yeah, you're yeah. out of the dugout. I mean, yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying that 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 that's sort of the look. Years ago, I got in, invited to 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 try a case, and everybody's like, "Well, why you want to try this case?" And I'm like, "Because I'm a young guy. I I want to win. Uh, I do want to win. I want to win for the client. And you have to want to win for the client. I believe that. I believe that you can't just go into a case and say, I, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't." I don't, I don't want to win for the client. I just want to win. You have to want to win for the client. You have to also want, in my opinion, you have to want to win for you. And you, you, you have to want to win for you. And I'm not talking about being consumed with the result or consumed with how the jury being liked and, and well-received. But in the end, I mean, you have to, in every trial, you give up a little bit of yourself, right? Sure. I mean, you give up hours, time, energy, some health, um, some, um, in, you just give up so much. And so the, the trade-off for that is you have to want to win. And if you get to a point where you say, eh, I'm just in it for the process, 
and I hear lawyers say that, I just want to preserve the guy's rights. I'm like, okay, well, you, you know what? You're, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong, right? You're kind of not doing. <laughs> you just said you give up too much personally. And it's so much that I think it's even hard for our partners, right? Like for those that are closest to us to truly right. understand the sacrifices. Right. That, to say it's just for the process. I will say for me, it's, I want what's best for the client. I, um, I, I, you know, and I don't mean to bring gender into it, but it, it as a woman, you know, it, it's, I don't ever really have like particularly close connections with clients. I do that intentionally. Um, I always have, you know, is how many hours I spend in a holding tank alone with, you know, individuals that are charged with, with the severity of crimes that they are. And, and sometimes they're, they're guilty of those offenses. Right. Um, and navigating those relationships is, is very tough, particularly Neil, you know, how long these cases can go on for, but I will say, I want to circle back to your point about when I called Jose from the driveway and was like, Jose, stop interviewing people, you know, use me. It was not because it was a high profile case. And I'm sure people think that it was because for me personally, I have felt like, and I have known that I have done a lot of really big litigation and I've been busting my ass and doing a lot of really amazing things in the courtroom. And I, I just didn't feel like as a woman that I was getting the credit. And I really mean this, like the light was kind of always on the room, you know, but it, it just, it, 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 I didn't feel like for me personally that um, people were really accepting my value, what I was bringing to the table. And I thought that this could be an opportunity. It could also have been an opportunity for total failure, because as you said, I'm not sure a lot of people would have succeeded with Jose Baez as a co-counsel. Like he demands a lot of um, limelight, you know, and he gets it and his track record is amazing. And he was very much of the narrative of this case. You know, you see every news article, it's like Jose Baez represented a Casey Anthony, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, yeah. And so I guess this goes back to your point of you have to do it for you too. Right. And that sounds so selfish, but actually we do give up so much. But you have to. This is, yeah. and, 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 I, and I don't mean you have to do it for you at the expense of your client. I never want anybody to take it that way. But every lawyer that I have interviewed ever, I mean, from uh, Jeff Lickman on, uh, you know, I think he was my first podcast interview. He's like, look, I want to win for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to win for the client, but this is a competitive, yeah. there's a winner and then there's a loser. And I'm not saying that the loot, but trials are won and we can define what, what win means. And we've all had the, where you walk out of, of the trial and you go, yeah, I kept the jury out for, you know, three hours in a case where I thought they'd be out in five minutes. And I know that's maybe a personal feeling, but the fact is that every lawyer at some point feels like I, you, you, you have to want to win the case. The jury has to feel that you're not just there protecting the Constitution. They have to feel your passion. For sure. And, and, and your passion comes in when you feel like, I want to I beat these guys. Mm -hmm. like, I want to win for this guy or this lady, and I want to beat these guys or them. Um, and, you know, I... Maybe I'm not articulating it as well as, we, as I could, but... Look, you don't go to a law firm where the guy says, like, you know, he's got a bunch of participation trophies on the wall. <laughs> For sure. And a bunch of, hey, this he's a good sport. Everybody <laughs> gets a nice guy going up. But but here's I use I think of it as investment, right? Like I want the jury and my client and everyone to know that I'm invested in this process. And that also goes back to mastering the, the discovery and the materials. But it also goes back to like Sometimes you come to court and you look really tired, you know, sometimes like day in and day out, you're, you're in that grind. And I honestly think that us trial lawyers don't take these cases and don't find these big moments unless we want and we value constantly being pushed. And for me, that's it. I want to be, I want to be pushed. I want to be made uncomfortable. I want to see how I thrive in that uncomfortability and it's the best. It's like the best, right? Um, yes. You know, Houston was a lot there of- is, There is, there are, I said this, there are few things 
to this day, big case or small case, they're all big cases to our clients, as you know. Yeah. There are a few things to this day as absolutely euphoric yeah. as hearing a jury say not guilty. It is it is a it is a, a feeling of euphoria and the clients who feel it, you can see even the ones who have the most brio and bravado and the most machismo, the ones who were when the jury's out, you can tell that they're like, wait, so this is really going to happen now. Like they're really going to decide. Yeah, they're going to decide, dude. They're, they're deciding. And then you can feel the air go out of their lungs and the weight, right? You can just feel it. And so, that, that, that happening in the whole room. So, yes. Yeah, yes. you know, like literally the energy, and I don't say that in like some, you know. No, no it, I know. Just, not- in the room, it changes. And then you realize that everyone in the room will never be the same. You know, and, and that might be just like, you know, small variations, but it's true, including us. There no, but is, you're right. You're right. We, we don't do the smallest of trials, let alone the biggest of trials. And we're not the same person on the other side because there's some kind of personal experience that we've had connection with jurors. We've been pushed to the limits. We've had to learn new law, tested in ways we never thought we could be tested before. And we come out, we come out different. I don't say whether it's a good or a bad measure, but it's different. And, and for me, I love that part of the experience because I never want to live in a static state. You know, I always like want to be pushed and, and that's just my personality. But there is, to your point, nothing better. And I will tell you that when I stood next to William Husserl and I heard the first and then, you know, the pattern of the 14 not guilties and, and I cried at the end and my friends, they were like, Manashi, don't show the country that you're capable <laughs> of emotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I want to go. So it's a huge win. It was. And I I know because I I tried the Charles Warren case and I put so much into that. And we had constant coverage here. And um, when the jury came back, um, I was I I thought there was one juror that hated me. And I was sure of it um, or didn't like our case and got to the point during closing argument where I was almost just trying to talk to that one juror and i was like trying to get eye contact and try to see if i could create you know what i mean and and it turns out that that juror was for us and that juror was one of the leaders and she just um thought he was not guilty from the start apparently and didn't really and they were very stoic because it was a they were it was a you know it it was it was a big trial um and i remember when the case was over I stood there and I was, there's a picture of me doing this. I I'm not a nail biter, but I was doing this. And I just was like, you know, you, you gave it a good fight. Neil. you really did. You gave it a good fight. You, you put on the best you could have. You put on a good show. You tried, you tried, you tried. And then we sat down and we had nothing on our desk. And then the jury read the first count and they said, not guilty. And I started crying. Yeah like leaned in and, and kissed my clients for it, who probably to this day is like, why'd that guy kiss me? You know what I mean? But I, but I was so like, I lived and died with that case. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, okay. So, so a couple of questions. So tell me about the, the, so Jose, uh, obviously at one point he and the client agreed to bring you in the case. And, mm-hmm. um, and then it seems like, um, I hate to say this, but I mean, that case had, a, a tremendous amount of, 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 of media coverage for, and, and I, apart from Jose's participation for good reason, for sure. That case was, I mean, in Yiddish, I would call it a Shonda. <laughs> Shonda is the Yiddish word for, you know, I don't know if you know, but it's the Yiddish word for, for it's a shame. I mean, that case was a Shonda. Uh, I yeah. mean, you know, and I, I didn't understand you guys charged with, 27 counts, then 14 counts. And they, then they add charges of attempted, mm. like attempted murder. So how did they attempt when the guy, I mean, and, and the, and the tension in the room seemed it was palpable on television. It was brutal. Yeah. So, so, so tell me about that. Kind of give me a flavor for that. 
you know, and it was, um, it's interesting you say that, that it came through on TV because I have always really prided myself on having good working relationships with prosecutors and U.S. attorneys. I respect that we're on other sides of the aisle, but, but Neil, you know this, right? Like in the end, <laughs> we have to be accountable because if we, if we piss off, you know, and we don't treat some prosecutor right, I'm back in that courtroom tomorrow, right? And it, with different client, but same prosecutor. So, you know, I, I have always been really sincere about picking my battles. And, and it's certainly not every prosecutor and every U.S. attorney. But I think by and large, you know, I, I'm very, um, I have very good re working relationships with those across the aisle. And we both need to exist for the system to work. That was not true in this case. Um, it was so contentious. Um, I think Jose, and I, I say his presence, not that he intentionally created this, but his presence really brought about a, a very real tension. Um, and then, of course, there was the cameras, and then there was the criticism that the state felt was coming their way. And then they felt like I had favor with the judge. They really did, you know, feel as if they were being backed into a corner. Um, you know, and what they should have done is actually then fought their way out. <laughs> um, and instead, they, they let themselves continue to be pushed back in the corner and then um, never came out. But I, it was really, really tense. And I can tell you it was tense with the judge, too. The judge and Jose had a very tense relationship. I, it was really it added an element to the trial that I haven't experienced in that way, even in you know, federal capital cases that I've tried where my client is, is accused of killing five or six people, um, different tension. And there was a lot more on the line. I mean, obviously for healthcare, I, the verdict meant so much. And so it really did have an impact much larger than Columbus, Ohio, right? Any of us watching that case, first of all, who've had an elderly or have an elderly or have been near an elderly parent or uh, heck I'll say it I've even cried at the at the the moments in um a, you know million dollar baby you know um where you've watched somebody struggle and die and choke on their you know on their own spit and can't swallow it's, it's excruciating yeah and I think all of us I'll speak for all of us when we were watching you guys try that case that in a way you were fighting for everybody. That's how it felt. Um, and I hope the jurors in some ways felt that, but, but it felt like that because it felt like this was a good man who, for whatever reason, was um, dealing with people that were arguing over whether or not you're talking about microseconds and seconds. nanoseconds yeah. in someone's life. It was like, you know, um, all right. So I don't know if you lost your phone. No, but I got, but, but to this point, Neil, I want to say that I also think one of our greatest gifts while we were kind of being judgy about um, COVID has certainly not been to the betterment of the development of young lawyers. The fact that we in Hussle had the benefit of COVID. And I mean, from COVID people for the first time had the visual of someone on a vent. They had a visual, unlike some many had before COVID, of what an ICU looked like, right? What someone, in, you know, that was suffering while dying looked like. And it wasn't just one person, right? It was hundreds of thousands. And I do think COVID really gave our jury pool a perspective that they wouldn't have had pre-COVID. Um, no doubt, almost all of us have had, you know, a loved one that um, have passed or even just our own thoughts about our own dying. Nobody wants to suffer when they're dying. If you say to somebody, what's your worst fear? How many people, Neil, say drowning? Well, when you're excavated, that's drowning. You're, you're literally drowning on your own fluids. Um, and so, you know, kind of coming face to face with that mortality and thinking about our loved ones and not suffering those we really I tried the case from that perspective and I had lost my dad a year and a half um, before. Oh, um, yeah. Thank you. But and 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 went through comfort care and um, and so it was personal to me, too. And we had so many jurors that it was personal for them, too. 
um, um, yeah. So tell me, tell me a little bit about, um, tell me a little bit about, uh, cause your, your passion, something you said during the trial where you were talking about your, how this trial was different from others. And I can tell you the, I can almost spit it back to you. You had said, judge, we just don't, that hasn't been this experience in this case. Mm -hmm. We just don't have that kind of rapport, that kind of collegiality, that kind of relationship in this case. It just, just, and you said, for whatever reason, it just hasn't been there. So we can't just sit down and talk. That's right. We can't just sit down and hash out jury instructions or, and I thought that was so prophetic. It really, in a way, I thought, to me, um, revealed how difficult that case was to, right? Oh. How difficult that case was for, for you in that moment. So, uh, because it... But Neil, it took on a whole different, you know, even when I was trying the civil case with a attorney from Chicago, we were picking the jury and there was just, you know this, when you're picking a jury, it's clear that let's just say financial hardship. There's like a mom of four that's, you know, says I'm the primary caregiver. We, we can't afford childcare. And you know, like I would just look at a opposing counsel and be like, and then we would, <laughs> you know, we would just know, like, let's not go further with this. And we will agree to excuse her without having to use the strike. There's so much of that in trials that cuts down on the time and the stress and just that kind of we're in this together, but not in a like, you know, backdoor fraternity way, just as in like, we respect the system, let's streamline things. Right, there was right, none of right. that. We couldn't even agree on what time to, to end during the day. We couldn't even agree whether we should have Fridays off. I mean, we could agree to nothing. And if Jose wanted it, then it was definitely, we were not getting it. I mean- so, I mean, so what was, so tell me a little bit about, I'd like to know kind of, I mean, what you're willing to share about the dynamics, you know what I mean, it, it, with that, because it just seemed like, I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. It just, I don't know if there were people who had their, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It was know. really- it, uh, the prosecutors and the judge and everyone, um, you know, even when we were in pretrial litigation, but man, was it true during trial. It's just, he rubbed everyone the wrong way. And, and, it, and, and I don't even mean that to necessarily fault of his own. He just, it was like, nobody wanted to like him. And then it became this, if Jose asked for it, literally, it was, we, it was presumed to be a no. Um, it was like a rebuttable presumption, but we but we began with no, and then I had to work to chip away at it. Um, you know, but but I will say he realized the dynamic too. And then you know that moment that you spoke about, Neil, just now, where I stood up because I'd had enough. Um, I, and really it was clear, and it and it was clear that you had because that that came right through. I mean, I'm telling you, it was obvious that there was something that was going on in that in that case. I mean, I could just tell. Yeah. You get, I mean, I, like those are things that you can't even like, if you, you, you have to try to peel all that back to talk about like how it got there. But as a trial lawyer watching you in that moment, I, 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 I felt for you. Like I felt your struggle in that moment where you were like, judge, it just hasn't been that way. Like, yeah. why would I ever open the door to that. And you told us to talk about, I mean, we can't have those conversations no. in this case, right? And Neil, that's exactly what I said. The judge was like, why can't you figure this out? And I was like, figure it out. I mean, I would love it if we could all sit down as adults and talk about jury instructions and say, okay, here, we agree, we agree. And now these are the three that we really can't agree to. I mean, we couldn't even, uh, we couldn't even agree on anything. And I mean, it was such a stress and, um, and they just were so resistant to Jose. Um, it, it was, it, it was really very it's stressful. I mean, what, and what do you make of that? Like, what's the, just, 
Well, I guess, I, I mean, what you make of it is that you won the case. And so, you know, that's what you made. Yeah. <laughs> you won. So, okay, let me, let me go to a different topic and ask mm -hmm. about how you ended up, the medical evidence in the case, the, you know, I've talked about that, how I thought you did a fantastic job of mastering, it seemed like mastering, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. the, the, the medical evidence in the case, which was just overwhelming. So much. So um, did you have a background in that? Did you just, did you work through it on your own? Did you have someone be able to kind of walk you through what the issues were? Did you spend hours at night just with these medical records kind of going through them and trying to figure it out? I mean, if it's possible to kind of share that process, I would love to hear. It. Yeah. Um, well, I don't use notes when I question witnesses. So I question from exhibits. I just stack my exhibits. And Neil, I'm sure you saw how messy sometimes the podium is with me. But it's never a note, right? I don't, I don't take notes. But I, I put the exhibits that I want to use in the order I want to use them. And then I pull the exhibit. And then I, I just know what questions I'm going to ask. So if that's your system, then you do need to master the documents. Because you have to master the file to know which exhibits you're going to use. Um, and certainly mastered, you know, the expert reports and, um, and the science of it. I will say that um, the night, I, I pulled two all-nighters before each of the expert crosses. Um, and William, our client, was incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. And I think he and I didn't have a close rapport until those cross-examinations. And I don't mean that as a, a judgment. It's just he was very close to Jose. Um, and so, you know, Neil, like when you have multiple attorneys, you know, everybody's playing a different role, you know, like he sat next to William, they had a very strong bond. But when I did those crosses, William and I got to know each other in a way that we hadn't. And, I, and he really did come to respect that I wanted to master the material. Um, and he was incredible resource for me. I mean, I remember the night before Schweiger, he was like, how late are you going to stay up? And I said, I'm going to pull an all nighter. And he was like, text me at any hour. I love that. A, it, and I, and I texted him all night. So, um, so, you know, shame on him for offering, but he was an incredible resource. And, um, although he didn't, I know, speak a lot or really have any facial expressions really much, much during trial, he was an incredible resource to me on those cross examinations. And, um, and I had no background, but I threw myself in because it goes back to this authenticity piece, you know, um, and I want to use their experts as our experts. And, I talked to the jurors afterwards and um, it seems that worked. So let me ask a few questions about your, so you don't use notes when you cross-examine. I don't. So do you have an outline somewhere that is available to you or do you just have it all like in your head? I have it in my head. It's pretty good. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to have in that in your cuppy. That's a lot it to have and in I your have very, I, I have a particularly small head too. Neil, I will <laughs> tell you that as I'm listening to the direct, I do, you know, kind of old school trial, right? We take our pad and we draw a line. Draw a line in the middle. Yeah. I put where there is a point that is important that I need to address that is not part of my exhibits. I, of course, like freehand, you know, psh, um, because we're nothing if we're not responsive to the direct examination. I mean, no question about it. And right. you have to be great trial lawyers. We have to be good on our feet. Correct. But I have, I have never wanted to be wed to paper. Um, okay. I think I'm more effective that way. I think I'm more, you know, dynamic and dramatic that way. And I mean, jurors love the entertainment. They, they do. And I don't mean just make it sound cheap, but they love the entertainment of it. And if we can entertain them, guess what that means? Is that they're listening to what we're saying. That's all we, that's all so, we need. So one of the things that, one of the things that I thought you did, so some lawyers use it, and I don't, listen, anybody, I don't fault anybody uses an outline. I don't either. Notes, different people have different, but I know if you're getting up there with the, with your, with those evidence, with just the, the exhibits. So, um, do you know the particular, have you already sort of mapped out in your head, like a, almost like a mind map, how you, yeah. how you want to go and like which directions you're going to go depending on how the witnesses answer. Cause some of those cross examinations right. were, I mean, they were long. Um, 
They were. No, Schweiger were was long, like five hours. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of those were, they were brutal. Yeah, so, I, I agree. I'm very flexible in my outline. I, I mean, in my like mental, where I'm going to go. I, I don't have, you know, I've got to go through one through 63. But I definitely have my exhibits there. While a witness is on direct, I'm oftentimes, if you see me at table, I'm grabbing a notebook and pulling out an exhibit and adding right. it to my stack. I mean, I'm constantly in movement because I, I think again we need to be responsive, um, and that's a, that's just effective cross examination. But I also want to say I don't begrudge anyone that wants to outline or write out every question. I, I tell you know the junior lawyers in our firm, you do you, whatever works for you, right. it makes you feel most comfortable. I do think though, Neil, I think as we progress in our careers, if we're reading paper. You know, and I saw like the debt trial, like the debt lawyers reading opening and closing statements from pieces of paper. I mean, you're completely missing a connection with the audience. And it's what you talked about earlier in that one case where you thought a juror didn't like you. And so you're sort of playing to that juror. Yeah. If you're reading a piece of paper, you're missing that moment, right? You're missing that opportunity of maybe I should make an extra special connection with that one juror so that, um, you know, when they go back in the room, they're for me and not against me. Um, and, and that's where I stand on it. But, you know, everybody has their own style and you got to evolve and, and try to. And I have to go back. Was there a lot of impeachment with prior testimony in the Husel case? Um, so you have to have trans. I mean, it really is a it's an impressive feat. I mean, Dan, it's very impressive. You have the medical records, prior statements. You've got if there are depositions in, the, in a civil case. If there were we had all the depositions. I I even, if you tell me that you only prepared for like 12 hours, I'm honestly going to gonna jump out. This no, window. It's not very lucky. far, so I'll only break my leg. But no, no, I'm <laughs> very lucky. I have, a, I have a very good memory, but I've also worked at it for a long time. But it was we had depositions with every witness because of all the civil cases. Right. Um, I, I will also tell you, you know, I spend a lot of time I read. Um, and when I read something, I really read to commit to it. You know, I don't do like, a, oh, this is my first pass and then I'm going to do more passes. I mean, I really read to commit to, to memory um, a document and not in a formulaic way, just in a I know the material way. I also it's funny you say that about impeachment. I'm going to go against the grain with most defense attorneys. I, I, I really love to refresh. Um, I know everyone loves to just dive right into impeachment, but nothing's better when you give someone the opportunity to refresh the recollection and you know, if it's contentious, they say that wouldn't help, <laughs> which I always love, you know? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, because there, there's a way, and I'm, and I, to, to do both, you know what I mean? There's certainly sure. a way if the witness is combative or says, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't recall that, or I don't, I don't recall saying that, and I don't recall, and then you're, well, why don't you take a look at your, That's, and I, I usually tell them, like, that. look, here, I know there are some lawyers who give a document to the witness or a transcript, and they say, you know, here, read lines, you know, six to nine. And I'm like, hey, you can read any part of this you want. Take as much time as you want. Flip through the whole dang thing. You know what I mean? So that's we'll what wait. I do. But if, you just, but if you just want to read six through nine, that's all you have to. But you read any part you want. I, I, I take it up there. I say, take your time. Let me know when yeah. you're done. And then I like walk the well and it adds to the drama. And I love every minute of it, right? Because I, they're like, oh, I thought shit. that was very effective. You, I thought you did a very good job of, um, you did a very good job of, and I'll pay you this compliment, of identifying ways to, to give the jury more than just um, words. Sure. Look, and I've said this before, and I said it on a past podcast, but this is one of the things that I think you particularly did well in this trial. Um, and it, it is a skill. I don't know if it was thought out beforehand, but it was a skill. And it was very effective because I remember it. Um, we remember images. The word not is not an active word. The word guilty is an active word. When you say not guilty, the, hmm. you're only defining guilty by, by, by not. By, well, what do you mean not? Not guilty. So when I tell someone it's a juror, we give a visual image. If I say, here's the visual image, Diane, whatever you do right now, do not think of a shiny red fire truck with a tall, shiny ladder and a fireman with the red, you know, light going and the Dalmatian, don't picture it. The, the word don't isn't an yeah. active word. And I thought one of the things that you did was you brought 
the some of the state's evidence to when you were hefting those mm -hmm. uh, there's two of these <laughs> when you're holding up the binders and you put the you know the little vials and the I thought that was so effective because that's how juror that's how people that they remember that and that it's it, I thank you I appreciate that when I talked to the jurors they said when I used the vials they were like that was so great it was and it's to your point and I had forgotten that until I saw your podcast that's to your point of those visuals right when we can when we can do more than just say words you know and then imagine Neil in a trial of this duration and I know you know this you you can't expect jurors to remember what you say in week one unless there's a hook right unless you have a visual unless there's a reason that you're giving them to remember that particular piece of testimony um because all of us after five weeks four weeks six weeks we're you know we don't even remember what we had for breakfast necessarily the week before let alone what you know the the nurse said in week one so you i think it's really important and it goes back to using you know their evidence as your own and and I'm sure that the, you know, the country kind of gasped when we didn't call any other witnesses other than Dr. Um, Eli, but that was a huge moment for me and Jose. Um, it was probably the biggest argument we've ever gotten into, but I, I really don't take on a burden uh, unless I have to, I believe as defense attorneys, um, it's their burden. It's their burden to prove. And if all we're going to do is put up witnesses and it's going to be a neutral, then what are we doing? Why are we assuming a burden when we don't need to? Um, if there's something you have to put on, or if your client is insistent, even after your, your best advice not to, well, of course, that's his or her right. But I, I, I just, Jose and I had some very real discussions um, about putting on other witnesses. And although we had a whole lineup, um, I thought we, we had done enough um, through our cross-examination. So I, well, I agree. I mean, you, and you obviously did. The verdict speaks for itself. But yes. I, and what's interesting is that, you know, um, I called the verdict. Now, I'm not saying that it was such a, you know, easy, that it was a hard, you know, case to call, but, um, you know, there were people that had doubts oh. about this and they had doubts about, you know, the amount of fentanyl and, and, the, and they kept splashing fentanyl, 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 fentanyl. And, um, and, but I really thought in the end, the narrative, you guys had a narrative, you stuck to the narrative. And so, um, I thought that was brilliant. And I told you, I think that the, your physical, your physical use of some of the exhibits, like, I'm not going to remember who was the expert that had some, had appeared. He was a state expert. He, the 29 page report, single spaced, a lot of words on it. Um, <laughs> Dr. Schweiger. Dr. Schweiger. <laughs> so, I mean, and some of the things that you asked them, I thought were, you know, were great and you recovered, but the things that I, I won't particularly remember all of the questions or the answers, but I will remember the, you know, I will absolutely remember the, the, the physical, like when you pushed over the cart and there were mm -hmm. like 14 cases and each had two binders and there were additionally more, I thought that just. I thought that was great. And I thought that the jury must have really appreciated that because you're distilling it down to something they can relate to. Yeah. And you know what else they said, which was fun, you know, because we're always trying new things. But during Schweiger, he had said he, he had said a lot of inaccurate things. Like he said, you know, this patient was on paralytics when actually it was a different pa patient, but he had cut and paste. And when I was doing the cross, I put, you know, the report up on the Elmo. And when I would confront him on it and he would say, oh, well, actually that's incorrect. I would physically cross it out on the Elmo in the report. And the jurors, when I went back there, they were like, we love when you did that. That was just so amazing. And it's, it's to your point of like leaving visuals, right? With the jurors. And it becomes also interactive, you know? It, it's like they're part of, you know, the scene that's going on. and. The more jurors feel feel like they're involved, the more they're going to pay attention. And I'm just convinced that if jurors are paying attention and you get jurors that are willing to really listen to the law, whatever happens back there, I mean, then, you know, then that's justice. I, I, I really mean that. Um, All right. So tell me your best cross-examination story. Put you on the spot. War story. Ooh. Give me your best cross-examination story. Or we can even make it. 
give me, I, I love to hear you know, when you watch someone even, cause I'm like a trial junkie geek. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, I see good cross, like I read cross books. I read books about lawyers. I, you know, I love reading that stuff where someone just ends up putting it together. Sometimes they pull the, you know, the carpet off from the witness. Sometimes they just let the witness know, Hey, I could pull that carpet out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could pull that rug out from under you. Do you want me to do it? Um, and I, and I love that stuff. I think it's just, you know, it's like art and, um, yeah. So, you know, you are a cross-examination junkie, obviously. I will tell you one thing I didn't get to do in Huso that I love to do, and you can judge me for this. I love it when the state puts up a huge key witness, you know, and there's just some moments where you stand up really slowly and you look at the jurors and then you look back at the judge and you say, I have no questions. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, because they did nothing to me. I mean, I love those moments because, and you know, Neil, when I do that and you know, the random times that I do, the jurors always laugh, like they get it, you know, like they, that person didn't even get anything on them. I think for me, there's not one cross that sticks out, but there's certainly, it's, I'm always really, really happy when I try different things. And, and I did that in Usul and I've done that in every case. And that speaks to sometimes you don't ask any questions you know sometimes you ask five and you destroy them um and you know sometimes you got to chip away slowly it's you know death by paper cuts over five hours um there's all kinds of way to as you know to it's effectively so, cross-examine but and some lawyers they they talk about um they'll ask like well you, you you guys say isn't that true or is that right or isn't that correct at the end and then there are lawyers who complain and say, why do they always keep saying that? Why should they just drop <laughs> that? You know, um, you know, and I'm, and I, I think that there's just, you have to be who you are. And I know there are, there are people that want to teach you to do things differently and you can try new things, but um, I mean, obviously whatever you did in that case was extremely successful and you just want a, a, a huge civil case, which is, you know, yeah. you know to your, and what was that case about? What was the civil case about? I represented the city um, and we sued the, the company that was the city's financial advisor between 2004 and 2015. So Neil was learning about fiduciary duty and, um, and the Dodd-Frank Act and all other kinds of things I didn't know anything about that now I'm unfortunately an expert on. But, um, <laughs> all right, but so what do, you, what do you teach at Harvard? What's your Harvard... What do you um, teach at Harvard? I teach trial advocacy. They have a, during J term, there's a three week intensive for three L's where intensive learn how to try a case. And the students are brilliant and so inspirational. And, you know, I go every year and I think if this is our future, we're, it's going to be bright. Um, but it's really, it's the best judges and attorneys across the country get together and it's eight hours a day and then demos for between two and four hours a night. It is a real it is a true commitment. Um, and the students just love it. I mean, there's, you really do come out of it knowing how to try a case, at least, you know, from that perspective, right. but the ultimate last week is actually at the courthouse. They have jurors. Um, it's a really intensive program and it's an incredible opportunity to meet people like Jose or Linda or, you know, just judges so, across the country so and hear all the war stories. You'd love it, Neil. We need to, I love war stories. So I want to hear about, so, yeah, I, I do want to, I know in the, in this trial that Jose gave the closing, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right. <laughs> so, no, 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 I have nothing. I mean, listen. I, Wait, can I, can I tell you something funny yes. about that? Because Jose, I told him this. He texted me about the civil case and he was like, you know, he won and he was sending me a congrats message. And, you know, he was like, he asked if I missed the team. <laughs> and it, Jose would laugh that I'm telling you this. And I said, well, you know, I missed the team, but it was sure nice to be able to do the opening and closing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Love so um, he did do the closing, but, yeah. um, but there was no discussion, you know, and I, and, and that's just, that was part of the deal, you know? So um, when, when the trial was, was over, I know that <clears throat> you were the one, you were, you were there and you remained and you um, took the mm -hmm. verdict. Part of that is probably locality and proximity. Um, but I mean, there is something to be said for being there when the verdict is, is read. Um, it, it, there is, it goes, 
we've talked about it. Sometimes they go for us and sometimes they go against us. Um, but there is something to be said for being there. Um, I thought that was a great moment for you. Um, and so I glad we had a chance to become friends throughout all this and yeah. chance to, to talk. So are you now like crazy into healthcare cases? Is, are you getting calls from nurses so, and doctors everywhere across the universe? Like, yeah. Yeah, I just actually, before I jumped on this, there's a nurse that's been charged with involuntary and reckless homicide. Um, it's caring for a patient at the nursing home where she worked. You know, I think more of these prosecutions will come. I really do. Um, especially, sort, certainly, you know, in the, you know, with these opioids, I, I think that kind of epidemic is bleeding into our healthcare and how can we prosecute in that space? But, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm getting lots of calls, which is a great problem to have. I want to circle back though, Neil, and say something just kind of between us. I think, I think being there, um, that's a true defense attorney when you're there and you don't know the verdict. Um, you know, I walked in the courtroom and I've done a lot of, you know, big murder cases and death penalty cases. And so one of the measures, as you probably know, is how many deputies are in the courtroom, right? Um, you know, when it's a big case and, and lots of publicity and, you know, the courtroom staff, of course, know the verdict before the rest of the world does. And so, you know, you know that where are the deputies standing, are there extra depths in the back? And I walked in and, you know, it was very, it was to say it was somber. I mean, you couldn't even hear, I, I mean, it was unbelievable. You could hear a pin drop in there. So quiet. It was so crazy when I walked in that, that room to hear the verdict, but I looked for the depths and I saw where they were standing and I thought, you know, there's no more, there's no more deputies here than there were at any point in the trial. And, um, and I held that like close, like to my heart when I stood at the table, I really do mean that because I felt sick standing there. But I think that's the real deal, right? When you stand there and you just don't know. Um, and we were, we've done this for too long that we think we know or we make predictions because that's just a danger zone. But I also think that talking to jurors afterwards when we have the opportunity is that any of us trial lawyers that aren't doing that are missing the greatest opportunity ever. Um, you know, the good and the bad is knowing what worked and what didn't work. And um, I think that's how we become better. Like I've learned so much from this jury. They, a few of them have become friends of mine. <laughs> um, I mean, they had a jury party and invited me. I mean, it's a really special group of people that is a, it'll never happen again, how this trial has unfolded, but. So um, yeah, I, I don't want any, I don't want anyone to take away from the fact that I have such crazy respect for, um, for, you know, Jose, because I really, oh, me too. I, I, oh, I know. And I just so admire what he's been able to accomplish in a courtroom. I mean, you know, he has just obtained some incredible verdicts, um, which is really tremendous. I mean, you can't, you, you know, you can't argue with that level yeah. of success. And so um, it's the, so the, a, a couple of things I want to ask about, how would you describe your cross-examination style? Like I know everybody tells me, oh, I've got different styles and I change it up for each witness and every, mm. but if you had to pick one characterization, like one word to describe Diana Nashi as a cross-examiner is, what would it be? Surgical. I think that's, I think that's true. <laughs> that very, it's a great word. That really came across during your, during the Husel trial. Okay. If there's one person that you would like to cross-examine, oh. I mean, like any, let's anywhere in the world, dead or alive, who would it be? This is like the question at the dinner party, like, who do you want to have dinner with before you die? Um, I don't have an answer to that. Do you? What's your answer, Neil? Obviously you have it. It's your question. Who is it? So, and I wouldn't use the experience to, to meet somebody like it wouldn't, like I've had different, someone once said, I'd like to be able to cross-examine uh, Abraham Lincoln. I'm like, you would? They're like, yeah, because then I get to meet him. I'm like, okay, oh, I mean, okay. you know, I mean, come on, you know. Um, Sarah Swain once said she wanted to cross-examine O.J. Simpson because she's like, a, she, she knew she'd get him to confess. Oh. And I was like, oh, that's good. I, got, I like, you know someone alive i think i would like to cross examine alive now I'd like to cross examine clarence thomas or ginny thomas mm. um or ted cruz but i mean cross examine i'm not talking about a debate yeah, yeah. i mean 
I'm not Ted talking Cruz about sound bites. Better. Yeah, I'm not talking about sound bites. I'm not. Ta I'm talking about a, uh, have a seat in the chair. Raise your hand. There's no walking off the set because the deputies will bring you right back. And I would like to have that kind of, you know, where you because I watch, I watch the way politicians talk. And they don't answer the question, like Mitch McConnell. Anyway, and, and I'm not just picking on Republicans. I could do, you know what I mean? Or yeah, yeah. I could do the opposite too. The, but I mean, they're the ones just uh, that come to mind as of late. And I just think, okay, you know what? I would have a seat. Then you know I have I mean? to add Kavanaugh to that because I thought there were so many missed opportunities with that hearing. Um, so, so those would be some examples, you know, for me. If I had to pick one person in history, so the problem is it's the, the one person in history that I reviled the most. Mm. The one person that I revile the most, there isn't much to cross-examine on because, I mean, I, I grew up uh, the grandson of Holocaust survivors. My grandparents, um, um, you know, came to America mm -hmm. to flee uh, Nazi persecution and anti-Semitism. Um, so Hitler, of course, is mm -hmm. incomparable in how awful a person he is and i hate when anybody tries to say they're nazis or they're you know what i mean that because it's there's no there's no comparison the nazis were really i mean they, they stood on a platform all on their own but you know cross-examining hitler i mean he's already he's yeah admit, i mean he's admittedly in my the most horrible person to ever you know to ever mm -hmm. exist i mean in my opinion i guess i could ask him that one question Aren't you the most horrible person to ever exist? Who would be worse? Who would <laughs> you know? be worse? <laughs> um, so I've thought about, I mean, so that's sort of, you know, who I've, I've thought about. I've thought about those kinds of, but nowadays I'm most frustrated by watching um, politicians who seek not the opposition to attempt to convince anybody. They just yeah. seek their, an echo chamber. And I think that's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, you know, those are, Trying to think who would I never been the question that been turned on me, but I would say if I had to pick someone alive, it would be like a Mitch McConnell with the with a with a judge. I mean, I'm talking about like a real fair. I don't need you to give me any favors, judge. Don't lean towards me. Just don't have me start from behind. You know what I mean? Let me start equal. And let me let me cross examine Mitch McConnell where he can't duck and dodge. And you know what I mean? Yeah, for so sure. you said this guy was like the worst guy ever. Like you said that he was a buffoon and you would da 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 da. And that, you know I mean, but if he's the nominee for the party, you would vote, you would vote for him. I mean, you know, that kind of a, but that, you know what I mean? And then work, you know, work backwards. You know what I mean? Like what disqualifying feature would there be? You know what I mean? Like, well, it could be so fun. Actually, Ted Cruz would be really fun too, especially, you know, with, with all the tragic, um, issues with respect to guns that are going yeah. on there, there would be there would be some good cross-examination there okay. you think I, about cross-examination clearly more than i do so i need to no 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 i just no. I, I i think about all the trial like i i am look i i i love i i love the 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 test of mm -hmm. being able to take on opposition that let me put it this way when I, I love the voir dire. Mm -hmm. um, I I love the opening. I'm not one of those guys who just, you know, comes and has an opening and goes, yeah, that was good enough. You know what I mean? Like, I will sit there. I'll start with my thought about an opening. I'll I'll just, you know, turn it over in my head a million times, turn it upside down, think it was horrible, scrap it. And then, of course, come back to, you know what I mean? In a moment of clarity, come back to the one that I had originally come yeah. up with. Um, I love themes. I once had a theme in a case where I talked about how this whole case I had to come up with a theme. And I thought that my theme was that um, the, the police um, had, they were caught without their drawers, which was a, a variation on the, you know what I mean? Like uh -huh. they, you know, they yeah. didn't, they were caught without their drawers on, right? Because they claimed that they had found this evidence in a place and the evidence was found in this place in a, in a house where it was all, I mean, all I was missing was like a, hello, my name is, this stuff belongs to me. You know what I mean? All of it, mm -hmm. everything yeah. here. And the, the officer, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The officer at once, you know, there's like three pictures of him perfectly positioned with like a gun right in the middle. And I'm like, okay, you know, and so it was like almost gift wrapped. And I finally, at one point, I, the officer kept saying, well, I found it in, I opened up the, the nightstand dresser drawers. And that's where I found this stuff. And I'm like, so we start combing through every picture in this house ever. Interview everybody that had ever lived in that house. There had never been wooden nightstands with drawers. They had been like little metal, you know, like end tables. So once we had the officer, you know, once we had him commit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then I said, you know, they were caught without their drawers. And the juror starts laughing. And I said, you know, you know, it usually means you did something wrong and you got caught with your pants down. You didn't, you know, and you didn't have any underwear on. I said, in this case, they literally were caught without their drawers. And we said, <laughs> they say that they found something. And I show them the, here's what they claim. And here's what it really was. They were, and the juror just, the trial loved was over. It. I mean, oh, yeah, it was over. They loved it was, it. They loved so, it. yeah. So I think about all stuff like that. I don't know. I mean, like I said, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a, a junkie in that way. Yeah. I've come to love 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 voir dire and it's so funny because i used to despise it I, i'm not kidding you like in my first five years i would say you know i would remind jurors like if i do anything that you know offends you you can't hold it against my client like my insecurities in my first five years you know were I, I, you know, I know I roll my eyes in the courtroom and, you know, I can be histrionic and I'm sarcastic. And, and I, I was young enough where I felt like those could be potential liabilities because I hadn't really come into my own. Right. Um, even, even though I had just in, in the work itself, but just in my personality and you really do, if you want to just crush voir dire, you've got to just kind of let go, right. Of any inhibition that, that you might, be experiencing because somebody doesn't like you and really take it as a challenge. Like if they don't like me, you know, then what can I do? How can I pivot? How can I get that person's trust? But right. I, I think you win in voir dire and closing, you book in the case, you're all good to go. Um, throw in some really great cross and, and you might just get 14 not guilty verdicts. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Love it. All right. So hey, what, Neil, I'm so appreciative. You've what been lies ahead for you? Just give me the what lies ahead for you. What's on the what's on the cusp for you coming up? I want to try a lot more cases. I think that's that's going to happen. I'll, I'll probably close out the year with uh, with eight trials. Um, I've got some big ones coming up and just really continue to try lots of cases. And, and I'm really focused also on the diversity of my trial work. I, I want to do civil. I want to do really focusing on healthcare. Um, you know, continue to do federal capital cases. I have three of those right now and, and really just work on the diversity of my work because I think it, it challenges me in ways that, that keeps me excited. And if anybody wants to find you other than just type in, you know, like, you know, Husel <laughs> lawyer, how would they, how would they find you? Uh, just type in my name and my firm is Ice Miller. Pretty easy to remember. Ice or there's Miller. only one Diamond Ash, you know. <laughs> there is only one Diamond Ash. <laughs> That's right. Diane, it's been such an honor. Um, oh. I do consider you a, a friend, a peer. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not impressed with a lot of lawyers. And I thought you just really just uh, showcased yourself in a way that wasn't, um, wasn't a look at me. I thought there were so many moments that lawyers could go back and watch and say, you know what, that's just a great bit of artistry, great bit of work, great bit, bit of, of just some just laying yourself out there. Like I said, I'll never forget just talking about the, the honesty of that moment where you said about the dynamics of that trial. Um, I mean, that was a very, a lot of lawyers have probably wanted to say that. Like, Judge, I just can't sit down in this mm -hmm. case. I don't know if that'll happen in the future. It may have happened in the past, but in this case, it just, it's just not that way. And I thought that was so well articulated because it's what a lot of lawyers have, would want to say. In yeah. moments where they just feel like the judge is, you know, we just don't have the dynamic that you think we do, judge, or that you think we should. And I can't, at the expense of the client, create that in this moment. It's like exactly maybe later, how I felt. It's maybe exactly later how things I felt. will fix themselves. Maybe not. But right now, and you said it, like that is my priority, not this. And I thought it came across uh, really effectively. 
So well, I appreciate that. Well, I anyway. have to tell you that I was telling someone that I was doing this and um, they asked me about you and I was like, oh, we're going to try a case together one day. We will. So we we got to make that happen. We, we'll we will. To, we will definitely. We'll make it happen. We will make, we'll it, make happen. it happen. We'll have we'll to coin toss about who crosses who, but um, I think we'll make it work. <laughs> <out. laughs> we'll make it happen. Diane Manashi, it is such an honor. I consider you a friend and kudos on uh, what is just unlike is, is going to be a incredible yeah. uh, career and year and, and just looking forward. I'm telling you, I'm very impressed and very honored that you joined me here. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. you. Thank you. It. Well, I'm just so happy that the case brought me to people like you. And I mean that it sounds cliche, but I couldn't be any more sincere about it. It's like the world is bigger yet smaller. It's really fantastic. So very thanks for honored. having me. Neil. So thank you.